Before I get started today, I wanted to just say three words to you, and that is that I love you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I do love you. And, uh, and, and, I, and I want you to really know that I love you because Wednesday night, God woke me up at 2 a.m. Go God. And he gave me a word for you at 2 a.m. Wednesday night. He gave me a word, and this word was so specific. And I don't know if you've ever, you know, woke up in the middle of the night and thought something the next day you couldn't remember it to save your life. And, and, and I remembered this. This was, this was God's word for you. And this is, this is what he said is he said, sometimes my word comes as a seed. And other times my word comes as a sword. And I'm going to break that down today. And and the reason I said, I want you to know I love you (laughs) is because today's word comes as a sword. And it's not, I'm just telling you, it's not going to feel good. Like you might want to leave now and it's okay if you do. But sometimes God's word comes as a seed where he, he drops a word, a message, an idea, a concept in your heart and over time, it, it, it germinates and it begins to grow. And it doesn't feel so invasive. And then other times, his word comes as a sword. So sometimes, sometimes God gives you the word as a seed. Other times, God gives you the word as a sword. Sometimes in life, God just plants a seed into your heart. And then other times, he, he shoves a sword into your heart. And, 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 and I want to read to you what the Bible says for a minute. In Hebrew 4, Hebrews 4, verse 12, this is what it says. It says, for the word of God is alive and active. Does anybody believe that today? It, it, it's, a, it's alive. It is, it is living. And, and I believe that. I believe the word is alive. It's not just a, you know, 2,000, 4,000-year-old literature book full of historical parables and stories. It's, it's alive. The, the word of God is alive. It's active. Now look what it says. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Right? So sometimes it's a sword. And, and sometimes God's word Yes, it comforts you. Yes. And other times God's word confronts you. But whatever way God gives his word, whether it's a seed, whether it's a sword, listen, either way, either way it comes as a seed or a sword, God loves you enough that he is always trying to speak to you. He's always trying to encourage you. He's always trying to change you and challenge you and lead you and show you. So whether it's a seed or a sword, he's trying to make you more like him. God is trying to make you more like him. And and, and so I want to read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, because this is what it says about God's word. It says that all scripture, everybody say all scripture, all scripture, all scripture is God breathed. God breathed. The King James Version, it says, is inspired by God. It's God breathed. What is the Bible for? What is the intention of the Bible? It lays it out for us. For teaching, for rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be, what? Thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so as I begin this message today, I want you to ask yourself this question. I want, I want you to ask yourself this question. Here's the question is, what are you building your life upon? What are you building your life upon? And with that, I'm gonna pray. Would you bow your heads? Father, we thank you today. God, speak to us. God, we need you to speak to us. You are our daily bread. Your word is our daily bread. 
God, feed us right now. Jesus, you said in Matthew chapter 5, inside of the Beatitudes, that they that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. So today, God, we hunger and we thirst for your righteousness, for your holiness, for your written word. God, fill us. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say amen. Let's give our worship team a round of applause today. My, on, my de- on my table, a little coffee table. Some people call it a cocktail table, but I call it a coffee table because I don't drink. But there's a little Bible about this big. Will you bring it to me? Monty, thank you, sir. Calvin, thank you, guys. These guys are fire. Are these guys fire or what? These guys are absolute fire. Last week, I said this phrase, and I want to say it again today because last week's sermon It's going to bleed over into this week's sermon, which is going to bleed over into next Sunday's sermon. But this statement I said last week is that you never truly know what you're living for until you know what you die for. So the question is, is what would you die for? Because that's what you're really living for. Like, what would you lay down your life for? That is what you're building your foundation upon. I would give my life away for fill in the blanks. Those are the foundations of your life. Now, it's important to ask this question. What am I building my life upon? What's the foundation? Here's the reason it's so important. In fact, it's the single most important foundation is the single most important thing that you need to focus on in your own life because people are building their lives on all sorts of things. People are building their lives. Some of you, some of you are here today and you're building your life on a relationship. Some of you, you're building your life on a bad relationship. Some of you, you're building your life on this quest, this search for significance and purpose. Some of you are building your life on that chase for success or that chase for money or that constant chase for pleasure. Or I build my life on seeking popularity. I I build my life upon my fears or my insecurities. Listen, some of you today, some of you today are building your lives, your foundations on the ways of the world. Okay, I want to dig into this because God's word has spoken so specifically about this concept that Jesus himself spoke about it. Okay, I know y'all quiet in here because I came with the sword, but I still love you. So you got to help me out. You got to help me because listen, it's a double-edged sword and the sword doesn't just work on you guys. It works on me too. So I'm going to need your help getting through this. These are the words of Jesus. I want to read Matthew 7. Look at these words with me. Jesus said, everyone then who what? hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell. We just sang about this and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. In verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell the floods came the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall listen i've titled my message today and probably next week and maybe the next week and maybe the next week firm foundation he is my firm foundation he is my God, Jesus Christ, is my firm foundation. Now listen, here is the hard truth. Here is the sword of God's word for some of you today is that some of you, some of you are building your life on sinking sand. Some of you, probably the 11 a.m. service, but some of you are building your life On sinking sand, your foundation isn't strong. And that sandy foundation, it will, listen, 
There is no arguing about it. It will eventually sink your life. Okay, in, in, in verse 27, look, look what Jesus said again. Verse 27, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And this is the scariest part of this verse. And great was the fall of it. And great was the fall. Jesus said, you build your life on the sand, great will be the fall. It will sink. Your life will sink. Everything that you know, it will sink. Now, I don't know about you, Impact Church family, but I have tried to build my life on the sand many, many, many times. And every single time, great was the fall. Every time. Every time. But you know what might be the scariest thing about building your life on the sand? This is the scariest thing, is that you don't even notice it until it's too late. Because when you build your foundation on sand, you don't even notice it until it's too late because it sinks slowly. It doesn't just drop like a brick. It sinks slowly, little by little. You're getting sucked under, little by little. You get pulled down until one day you discover that your own life has buried you. Has anybody ever lived this out in their own life? Raise your hand, because I certainly have. And this is the trick of the devil, right? It's like what I said last week. This is the trick. This is the scheme of the devil to just inch you off track and inch you into the wilderness, right? That's his trick. That's one of his schemes. Now, listen, look at what Jesus said. What did Jesus say the foundation for your life is? What is the key to foundation? And I want you to write this down. How do we build our lives on the firm foundation? He said, by hearing God's word and by doing God's word, right? He didn't say, hey, y'all, your firm foundation comes if you just hear the word of God. That's not what he said. He said, if you hear God's word and you do God's word, that is where you build a firm foundation, I could hear God's word all day long and not do it and be building my life on the sand. Let, let me tell you what the word of God says. It says that you should not drink alcohol to get drunk. I know it says that. I know it says that. I'm very aware, aware that it says that. I actually agree with that. But just because I know it says it and just because I agree that it's true, if I don't do it and I go out and drink to get drunk, eventually that is going to sink my life. It will eventually sink my life. I know what it says, but I'm not walking it out. This is where James talked about faith and action. This is where James, the brother of Jesus, said that you cannot have faith without works. Faith without works, he says, it's dead. So verse 24, Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. The, the, the firm, listen, it's so critical that we really allow this to penetrate into our hearts and souls because he says the foundation comes by hearing God's word and by doing God's word. It's not enough just to hear it. It's not enough just to know it. It's not enough. Listen, it's not enough just to believe it. He says, you got to walk it out. E even James one of the freakiest, I'm serious, one of the freakiest verses in the Bible to me is James 2.19. You know what it says? He says, even, the, he says, you believe in, in one God? He goes, good. Even the demons believe and shudder. <laughs> Ask somebody next to you, what makes you different from a demon? Will you do that? Come on, just, just, just play with them a little bit. Play with them. <laughs> it, 
it's not enough to just know. It's not enough to just hear it. It's not enough to just see it, read it, or even agree with it. I've got to walk it out. And this is also what James said. James said this in James chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. He echoed the words of his brother Jesus. He said, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. Okay, listen, and humbly accept the word that God has planted in your heart like a seed. For it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. So, so I don't just listen to the word. I, I, I'm going to do what it says. Now, th- there are some keys. There are some keys to building your life on the firm foundation. I said we're going to look at these for the next few weeks. Uh, maybe I'll bring the seed next week. This week's the sword. Maybe I'll come with the seed next week so that y'all want to come back to church, but today's the story. I don't just listen, but I do it. I'm I'm a doer. I'm a doer of God's word, not just a hearer. So what what are some keys? We're only going to look at one today. Point number one, it's the first time in my life I preach a one-point sermon, but today is a one-point sermon with a lot of other thoughts inside a lot of other thoughts. But number one is this, is that I build my life on the truth. I build my life on the truth. The, the, the truth. What is, what is the truth? Okay, the, the Bible says that the truth is Jesus Christ and the truth is his word. That, that's what it says. So I build my life on the firm foundation by building my life on the truth. Jesus said himself, he said, I am the way and the truth, and the life. And he said, nobody, nobody comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? This is fire, because we're going to peel this onion down to nothing. Okay? He said, I love that he says, I am the way. You know why I like that? Because there's, there's really only two ways you can go. In this world, there's only two ways. There's not more than two. There's two ways. You can go the way of the world, or you can go the way of the word. That's, that's it. There's two ways. I can go, I am at a crossroad in my life right now. I can go the way of the word, or I can go the way of the world. And let me tell you something, they look nothing alike. Absolutely nothing alike. The way of the world and the way of the word, there are no in-betweens. Now, I, I, last Sunday, I talked about this concept that the world is always changing. The world is always changing. The world as we know it has changed. It changes in every facet of life. Technologically, it changes. I'm 46 years old. Anybody 46 or older? Raise your hands. 46 or older. Okay, so, so, so you have been around long enough. See, my kids thought cell phones just existed since the Bible existed, <laughs> right? They, they don't have context. Technology, they, this is like the internet just exists, right? I mean, I didn't discover the internet. And by the way, the internet used to suck really bad when it first, I remember the internet and, and, and it was like 1995 or something. Remember Al Gore created the internet. And, and so, so I, I remember like, what is this? You know, I grew up, like the computer, you had like the Commodore, Game Station. And like, you, did, does everybody, you're my age or older. You remember, we used to have these phones that hung on walls. Do you remember that? You remember that? We used to have pay phone. You remember a pay phone? right? I'm done with practice. And I, I, had, I didn't have a cell phone. I had a pay phone and we were slick and sly. So you go to the pay phone. My mom, would, I get a collect call from Travis Hearn and she would say, no, I don't accept it. And she knew that meant come pick me up from practice because we were so broke. We couldn't afford a quarter. Right? Right? I, I mean, 
technology has advanced. I mean, here we are with these crazy computers and Wi-Fi and cell phones. And I, I mean, there are advancements in science. The world is always changing. It, listen, the world is changing morally. Its standards change. Its values, its morals. It's always, listen, this is not new. This is not new to our lifetime. This is a pattern throughout humanity that the world standards, perspectives, always changing. Okay, let me give you some life examples. Most of us weren't alive for this. Chances are good nobody was, but there might be somebody that's old as dirt in here today that a that hundred years ago, alcohol was illegal in the United States of America. Alcohol. Right, right? Can you imagine? It doesn't mean they still didn't drink it. I mean, they had bootleggers and stuff, but like it was alcohol that was during the prohibition that was made. Okay, now, now, now almost every, every state in the country is legalizing marijuana. <laughs> Those of you guys that have context and you're old as I am, you're like, like if you would have said that to me back in the 80s or 90s, I, I'm not here to tell you that that the alcohol's wrong or that marijuana's wrong. I don't have any argument about other than what the Bible speaks to me about such topics. Okay, but 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 here's here's what I always think about. I always think about end games. You ever think about end games? What's the end game? What's the end game? Okay, what 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 what's next? Let, let's legalize marijuana. That's not the devil's end game. I, I, well, you know, maybe we should just legalize cocaine too, and why not? I mean, half of Scottsdale's business people, they're doing cocaine just to try to get another dollar in their pocket to stay up at night, right? I mean, like, and by the way, Adderall is just legal cocaine, so maybe you ought to take a step back and go to our Celebrate Recovery and stop kidding yourself and get some help and get some freedom in your life and not be controlled by a substance, but be controlled by the savior of the world. His name is Jesus Christ and he can set you free if you let him work in your life. And that wasn't even in my notes. So you know that was the Lord. Thank you, Mont. appreciate you. Man, so you know what? Let's get heroin legal. Why not? Why not? You tell me why not. If I want to do it, it's my body. If I want to do it, there's not one word called heroin in the Bible. So, so what I'm saying is that culture always changes. The standards, but the devil's end game, he's not done. What, what's next, polygamy? Polygamy, is that okay? Why not? If the world says it's okay, I mean, isn't it okay? I mean, what's the big deal? I'm in love with two people, three people, four people. What I'm trying to paint is this picture that the devil is at work. He is not done. Unfortunately, I think he's just getting started. Okay, listen, what is right today was wrong yesterday. What is wrong today might be right tomorrow. What's right today could be deemed wrong in 50 years. What's wrong today could be deemed right in 50 years. And so one of the tactics that the devil uses, how many here last week, raise your hand. Well, just the opposite. How many were not at church last week, raise your hand. Don't lie, you fry. If you lie in church, it's a special kind of fry. Come on now. I read this last week because this is what the devil's doing. Isaiah 520. They say that what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right. What is black is white. What is white is black. What is bitter is sweet. What is sweet is bitter. Do you understand why it's critical to know the truth? and to build your foundation on the truth, on God's word, because if you don't know God's word, 
you will be easily twisted. Okay, l- listen. The Bible says that the devil is the father of lies. He is the author of confusion. He is, you know the verse in Corinthians where he says he appears like an angel of light, right? This is his tactic. Now, now I want to say this. Is, is there anybody in here that like you'd be brave enough to say you're susceptible to certain temptations, okay? You're brave enough, but I'm going to ask you what it is. So, 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 so before you raise your hand. Before you raise your hand, you're brave enough to say, I am kind of susceptible to certain temptations. Alcohol, that's a great one. Greed, okay, that's a good one. Any others? Fun, that's a, that's a good one. Netflix, that's real. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Food, that's a good one. Anybody else? I don't want to miss calling anybody else's sin out. So, yes, sir. Weed, okay, that's real. Any. Y'all are laughing like you never smoked a J before. Come on, stop it. Anybody else? Anybody else? Run over here, yeah. What? Dessert. Dessert. I thought you were saying like Zert for short for Zertec or something like Zert. (laughs) Dessert, okay. Okay, here's the thing. We all, whether you want to raise your hand and throw it out there in the middle of church or not, every single one of us has susceptibilities to certain temptations. All of us. All of us, everybody does. And unfortunately, it's not just one thing. It's lots of different things in our lives. I I wanna read, this is so important. I wanna read to you again the words of James, the brother of Jesus in James chapter one, verse 14 and 15. Look what he says, this is so good. He says, we are tempted and drawn away and trapped by our own evil desires, then our desires conceive and they give birth to what? Sin. And then sin, when it fully gives uh, birth and fully grown, it gives birth to what? Death. This is why Romans 6.23, Paul said, for the wages of sin is death. Because, listen, do, do not make this mistake in misunderstanding that there is always a price for sin. I know, I know. It's your first time. It's not always like this, I promise. (laughs) But sometimes we preach so much of God's love and grace and forgiveness and mercy and we don't balance it out with there is a wrath There is a wrath. I don't like to talk about it either. But there is a wrath. There is a balance, right? Paul talked about this balance in Romans 6. In Romans 6, he goes, so what shall we do then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? And he says, by no means. Right? This is good stuff. And so it's important that we understand. Listen, I want, I, want to, I want to look at this again. He says, we are tempted. You are tempted. You are tempted because of your own desires. You're drawn away and trapped by your own desires. Then our desires, they're evil, conceiving give birth to sin, and sin when it's fully grown gives birth to death. Now listen, pay attention to that phrase right there because I'm going to lean into it for a few moments. He says, Trapped by our own evil desire. Trapped by our own. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like I have evil desires. Do you feel like you have evil desires? You know what makes a desire evil? Is it goes against God's word. So, 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 so Sam, I, I like nice stuff. I do, I like nice. I grew up, dude, Poe. Like, dirt broke poor, right? My mama, she, she provided for, she had me at 16. She didn't have a fighting chance at childhood. She put food on my table. I never missed a meal. I, but you know what? I got my clothes at, at like secondhand thrift stores. I don't know if, if anybody else can relate to this, 
But like, like you know, is you get it at the thrift store or the hand-me-downs. Nothing ever fit quite right. But I had clothes, right? I had one pair of brand new basketball shoes in high school. One pair. I raised money to pay for them. It wasn't that my mama didn't provide for me. She did provide for me. We just didn't have an abundance where PT was showing up to school in, you know, his Gucci flip-flops or something like that. It just wasn't that way. So, so there's these desires that we all have. Desires. I have desires. I have desires, but what makes a desire evil is when that desire jumps over a line and it now goes against God's word. Because desires in themselves can both be good and bad. They're not all bad, but they're not all good. So I get trapped by my own evil desires. It looks good. If it didn't look good to you, it wouldn't entice you. This young lady over here said, one of mine is alcohol. For some of you, it's not alcohol. For some of you, that has no pull on your life. Okay, so that's not a problem for you. For her, that's a problem. For me, that's a problem. I come from a long line of alcoholics, drug addicts. I got family members, a cousin, an aunt, died of heroin overdoses. I've got a long line of addiction. I have drank a lot before. It is a problem. So I stay as far away from the problem that I can absolutely stay because I don't want to make myself vulnerable to my problem. See, it's important because he said, you know, you know the old phrase, like, the devil made me do it. Nah, he didn't make you do it. He might have thrown the, t- he set you up, but you did it. I told you it's a sword. I feel like I got to keep apologizing, but I just, but you know what's great about what I'm doing? This is God's word. I did not make this stuff up. I'm just regurgitating what's already in his written word of God, and this is his word. So, now, it, it's interesting to me because, you know, the Bible talks about the end days and end times and the last days. And there's a lot in there. I mean, there's a lot in there. But do you know that the Bible tells us that in the last days, there is going to be an overwhelming rise in evil? Did you know that the Bible says in the last days, the last days, there will be an overwhelming increase in human knowledge? You ever think for a minute and go, man, for 2,000 years, there was, for 6,000 years, for 4,000 years since Adam and Eve, for four, for, no, for 5,000, I'm trying. For 5,900 years, basically. 5,900 years since Adam and Eve. There was not a car. When Jesus said in the book of Acts that they were all in one accord, he did not mean a Honda Accord. (laughs) He he wasn't in some, you know, he is a Camelac Escalade, you know what I'm saying? Like, you ever think about the rise in knowledge as it relates to the last days? It's incredible. When I was a kid, I was born in 75. I watched this movie when I was a little guy, and it was called Thief in the Night. It was about the rapture, and people had to get the mark of the beast because in Revelation it says no one will be able to buy or sell without the mark. The mark of the beast is actually the, mark, the number of man which is where we get that number 666 because the number of God is seven, which is completeness and fullness. And the number of man is always short of the fullness and the goodness and the glory of God. But when I was a kid, this, this movie depicted like the mark of the beast, like a tattoo. You know what I mean? Like 666, I can buy some bread. Thank you very much. Right? It's like, That was as far as our technological minds and movie making could even think at the time. It must be a tattoo. Now, we know that every human on the planet could be 
chipped with a, a, a chip and planted in their body today. I'm not saying that's the mark of the beast. This is a whole other conversation. Now, I can see you guys are hungry for this because you're like, You're like, man, I brought my neighbor today. I didn't know I was going to get the hell scared out of me. Like, whoa, dude. So I want to read to you because the Bible says in the end days there's going to be a rise of evil. There's going to be a rise of confusion. There's going to be a rise of perversion. There's going to be a rise of all this stuff in the last day. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5 Paul's telling Timothy this, and he says, but Mark this, he says, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This is the part right here that blows my mind. Having a form, a form of godliness, but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. You look like you're a Christian, but you don't live like it. You look the part, but you are not the part. Right? It's like Matthew 23. It's a book. It's a chapter. And it's, it's a bunch of woes. Woe to you that this. And woe to you that that. It is literally like a woe. Because it's intense. And God is like, some of y'all look like whitewashed tombs. You're good on the outside. And you're full of death and decay on the inside. How would you like Jesus to say that to you? He said, the end days, people going to look like they love Jesus. They don't. They're confused. In the end days, people are going to look, they're going to look the part, but they're not the part. Now, let's jump, let's jump a little bit further in Timothy to this, the next chapter. Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4. Look what he says. This is frightening. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Listen. They will follow their own what? Desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. So you answered this question. Doesn't it seem like we're in the end times? Because I just noticed every one of those is true. Every one, I don't like what you're saying. So I'll find somebody that teaches it the way I want to hear it because of my own desires. And so if you notice the theme here, notice a theme. I've read a bunch of scripture and I got more coming. Here's the theme. Our own desires, our own flesh, our own desires, our own flesh, they entice us and then they trap us. Galatians 5.17 says, for the desires of the flesh, the desires of your heart, they're against God. They're against his spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these, listen, they're opposed. They're in a war with each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. This is why Jeremiah 17.9, he said the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I have a question. Has anybody ever had their heart deceived? <laughs> Aren't those fun times? Like you know that you know that you know that you know this feels right, this is right, and then five years later you look back and go, what in the hell was I thinking? Anybody ever been there? I mean, come on, man. That's about as real as I can be. I have been there not once, not twice. I don't even know how many times. And so again, there's the way of the world and there's the way of the word. In Proverbs 14, verse 12, King Solomon, he said it like this. This is, this is he, he said, there is a way that appears to be right but in the end, it leads to what? Death. See, this is where it keeps ending. It keeps ending in, in, in death, right? I, I told you guys this a few months ago, but I collect antique Bibles, and that's why I had 
Monty, go grab this one off my table because my ADHD self forgot to bring it out when I came out. But uh, I, I collect these antique Bibles, and I have Bibles from all the way back to the 1600, early 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, uh, I, uh, 2022. I've got Bibles. And, and what, what, what this Bible is from 1642. This Bible is from 1642. Now, one thing I love about collecting antique Bibles is that sometimes I really score and I see where people journaled through them three and 400 years ago. I have a Bible from the Civil War era where a soldier from the North journaled through it. You tell me that is not the coolest thing ever. I can see what he went through. I love collecting antique Bibles, and, and some of y'all have given me a, a couple, and I, I just want to say thank you for that. I, I, don't, I don't want you to have to give me a Bible, but if, if, if you do, I, I'm so grateful. This is my favorite thing other than my wife and my babies in the whole world is God's holy Bible. Sometimes I just sit and I stare at these because, and just soak it in for a minute because this was somebody's Bible. This was some, this guided somebody's life 400 plus years ago. This was their, their standard for living. This served as their moral compass. This served, this got somebody through the valley of the shadow of death. This got somebody through the storm, through the fire that they were in. Sometimes I just sit and just, in awe that this Bible, this Bible was good to somebody. But you know what I love most about a Bible like this is that this Bible is over 400 years, it's over 400 years old. Genesis to Revelation. This Bible has not changed not one word of this bible has changed not a single word not a phrase not a sentence it is the same the same 10 commandments the same new testament stories the same book of revelation the same book of genesis it's the same because the world's ways always change but God's ways never change. They never change. I said this last week that we're living out today, we're living out the book of Daniel. I encourage you to read the book of Daniel, maybe this week. For all the kids that are going to youth camp, may we read this book of Daniel. We are living in the days of Daniel. Do you know what the days of Daniel represented? It represented culture around them changing rapidly, laws being put into place, and you must comply to the laws that have been made or you will die. Remember last week I preached on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the king Nebuchadnezzar made a 90-foot golden image of himself, and he said, everybody must bow down and worship the king, the image of the king. And if you don't, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. And I love Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they inspire me because in the face of death, comply or die. Man, I ain't bowing down to that, you clown. I am not bowing down to that. I love it. It inspires me. I refuse to comply with something that goes against the word of God, even if it means I have to die. Listen, their faith, this is so important. Their faith, their faith, their faith was stronger than their feelings. Because I don't know about you, man, if I was about to be killed, you, see, you better not preach the rest of this message or you're going to be murdered right on stage. I'm going to tell you, that's a human moment. And I'd like to think that my faith would outweigh my feelings. 
I'd like to think that I would do the right thing no matter what that costs my life. You fast forward a few chapters in Daniel 6, there's a similar story. New king, Darius. And there's this great man of God named Daniel. The Bible says that Daniel had an excellent spirit. In fact, because of his excellent spirit, he got promoted above all the other 120 governors. Well, guess what? They didn't like that too much. They got jealous. And so they got jealous and they devised a plan to take Daniel down. They tied him, they, they, they tried to set him up to fail. Listen, they tried to set him up to fail. They tried to set him up to fall. See, this is what the devil does to us. You know, he doesn't stop. He wants you to fail. He wants you to fall. He wants you to fail. He wants you to fall. And so these people got jealous. They devised a plan and they went to King Darius and they played on his ego and they said, King, you are the most powerful man. You are mighty. You know what? We should make a decree that everybody can only pray to you. They can't pray to their own God. They can only pray. What do you say, King? And King's like, yeah, I like that idea. You know, one of the things I've learned in my own life is that Sometimes your haters don't actually hate you. They're just jealous of God's blessing and favor on your life. The other leaders are jealous, so they came up with this plan to take Daniel down. They go to the king. Nobody can pray to the king except Daniel. Now listen, the king loved this idea. Played on his ego. He had no idea it was a trap for Daniel. He had no idea it was a setup for Daniel. Okay, listen, here's the other thing. Here's the other thing I've learned in my own life is that the devil is the king of setups. The devil is the master at setting out traps for your life. Listen, he is trying to set you up to fail. He is trying to set you up to fall. He's trying to do everything that you can do to trap you. Listen, married man, that woman that looks amazing at work is a trap. That's a trap. And you understand how traps work? I feel like I need to say this. Okay, the whole point of a trap is that you don't see it coming. Like if you said, that's a trap, <laughs> oh, you sucker, no way. I'm going around that, idiot, like I didn't see that coming. A trap is disguised. It's disguised. It's hidden. You don't see it. That's the whole point of a trap. You don't see it. If you saw it coming, you'd step over it. You'd never get trapped. The trap is disguised. This is why it's important to be alert. This is why 1 Peter 5, 8 says, look what it says, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Okay, be alert and sober-minded. Say that out loud. Be alert and sober-minded. Here's PT's translation of that same phrase. Pay a freaking attention. One word, pay a freaking attention. Pay attention, pay attention. Be alert, be sober-minded, be on the watch. The devil is on the prowl. He's on the, he is trying everything to destroy your life, to destroy your calling, to destroy your anointing, to destroy your purpose. I gotta pay attention and watch out for the traps of the enemy. Watch out for Satan because he's slick and he's sly and he's deceptive. And Daniel was being set up. This decree that no one could pray to God, only to him or you'd be eaten alive and thrown into the lion's den. But I, I wanna read to you Daniel chapter six, verse 10, because this is good news right here. Daniel hears about this decree. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, 
He went home upstairs where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. I love this because there's a death sentence for anyone who doesn't comply, comply or die. And just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel said, I'd rather die. I'd rather die. I'd rather die praying to God, my real one and only God. I'd rather die for the truth than live for a lie. And so Daniel, it says he learned that the decree had been published and he went and did what he always did anyway. I went and prayed. And while he was praying, it was a trap. So the governors, of course, were spying on him and they caught him red-handed. I'd love to be caught red-handed praying to God. And you know the rest of the story. He gets thrown in the lion's den and God sends an angel to shut the mouth of the lion. And Daniel lived. And then in verse 23, it says, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in God. Man, I have like 10 more minutes if I'm fast. That's not going to work. <laughs> Especially with these long pauses. I don't preach so long, some of you took two restroom breaks. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I really am. I'm sorry. It's not our problem they decide to come to the 11 a.m. service. They should get here for the 9 a.m. So, right? I've been seeing, you ever see something that just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming and coming? It's like God's trying to show you something. And I've been seeing this verse over and 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 over again. It was the verse used at my son's graduation Friday night. I used it last week. I've been seeing it everywhere. And that's Romans 12.2 because Romans 12.2 says don't conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I, I don't want to conform. I want to be transformed. Don't conform but be transformed. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard not to conform because the world's that powerful. The Bible says that the devil is the prince and the power of the air of this world. He is powerful. And God is more powerful, but he's powerful. And so it's, it's hard. It's easy to get sucked. It's easy to conform. We've all conformed at times. There's this pattern. And that pattern is like a magnet that pulls us toward it. That, that, and listen, the world will do whatever it has to do to make you comply with its way. Or it will, it will persuade you. It will bully you. It will make an example out of you. It will boycott you. It will cancel you. It will slander you. It will hate you. And Jesus said, the world's going to hate you, but just so you know, they hated me first. And they hate me because they hate you because they hate me. That's what he said. Matthew 10, John 15, he said the same things. The world hates you because the world hates Jesus. Don't conform. Be transformed. Don't conform. Be transformed. Don't conform. Be transformed. I've been seeing this so much. I'm like, man, this verse must be for somebody. And I said, well, maybe it's for me. And it probably is for me too. I'm not sure if this verse is for you or the person sitting next to you. But I want you to look at him and tell him this verse is definitely for you. Come on, tell him this is definitely for you. Don't conform. I, you know what? I'm just edgy enough where I categorize Christians in my head. And it's an internal conversation that you never hear. But I'm about to let you hear it. Some of y'all are like, I call you casual Christians. You know what I mean? You're not on, there's no fire. Doesn't that feel good for me? You hear my inside voice? Some of you are casual Christians. There's no fire. Like, I love Jesus. Yeah, well, your life shows nothing about Christ. It's my internal conversation I'm having. Casual Christian. Some people are chicken Christians. It's like I'm a believer, but it's really between me and God. Your faith was never meant to be you and God. Never. Ever. Right? My favorite is some of you are chameleon Christians. Christians. 
Chameleons are cool, are they not? They turn all kinds of colors. Why do they turn colors? To blend into their environment. I mean, how many chameleon Christians are sitting here today? I'm a Christian. Riff, my hands are high. My house is built on you. It's really not, but I mean. <laughs> I'm a hand raising, Jesus loving, tongue talking, man, woman of God on Sunday mornings. That's it. And I go to work and I sound just like the rest of them. And I go to the club and I dance just like the rest of them. And I wear the shortest freaking crap you've ever seen. I'm a woman of God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Somebody pull this man off the stage. Some people blend into the darkness, and the thing about it is that Jesus spoke specifically about this, and I want to end with this, and then you guys are going to literally have to run out of here to get your cars out of the way for the next service. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, he said, let your lights shine. Let your lights shine. He said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp, put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others why? That they may see your good deeds, your love for Christ, your relationship with him, and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today, God, and that you are a firm foundation. And God, we just pray that uh, as we reflect on Romans that says, the wages of sin is death, but it also says, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life. And the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. God, that's every one of us, every single one of us. Fall short of your glory, your holiness, and your righteousness. Impact Church, if you're here today, listen, my whole intent in this sermon isn't really to jab you or to cut you, to hurt you. It's to help you. It's that, listen, sometimes the convicting, convincing power of God's word is exactly what we need. And if you're here today and you've never began a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to do that right now. To say, Jesus, today I give you my life. I surrender my life to yours. I surrender my will to yours. And God, teach me to live for you. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for unconditional love. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. God, we love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. We all say, Amen. Amen. Amen.